it's just incredible what's going on right now. I just got back from the Extraordinary Technologies Conference put on by the Tesla Tech Incorporated, which I found out about through Sterling Allen's website for Pure Energy Systems. That's PESWiki.com. Okay, so the first speaker at the conference was none other than Joseph Farrell, who is the author of many books which detail top-secret Nazi experiments, primarily Project Kronos, or the Nazi Bell Experiment. The Nazi Bell Experiment is based on the same rotating plasma technology as the TR-3B Flying Triangle, which I talk about in two of my other videos on anti-gravity. Those of you who have seen those videos know that, despite the corroborating evidence in multiple sources, I am still unsure of the formulation of this mercury-based plasma, or super ferrofluid. Luckily, my talk with Dr. Farrell has given me some clues to this mysterious Zerum 525, which the Nazis were using inside the bell. SS General Sporenberg's affidavit mentions thorium and barium oxides as elements within the composition of Zerum 525. The barium oxides suggest superconductors, and are in general agreement with the formulation given by Edgar Fouché for the TR-3B's magnetic flux field disruptor using mercury doped with barium, calcium, and gold. Dr. Farrell makes a valid circumstantial argument for the possibility of a thorium-229 isomer. First, there is the persisting thorium mystery that Allied intelligence teams going into Germany discovered, namely that the Nazis were stockpiling massive amounts of it. By any standard physics of the day known to the Allied scientists, this made no sense, and accordingly, they have not solved this mystery to this day. However, in his book Philosopher's Stone, Farrell believes a relatively strong case can be made that the Nazis had access to some primitive type of laser isotope separation. This, of course, would have been the ideal method for separating isotopes, and particularly isomers, that they wanted. Thus, the stockpiling of all this thorium makes sense, for 229 isomer exists in only a few parts per million, and to obtain enough quantity to be useful in the Zerum 525 would have required massive stockpiling of the element. The use of this particular isomer makes sense since its excitation threshold is very low. As an isomer, it exists in a high spin state, and from Farrell's research into the Bell device, the Nazis were after each and every means possible to maximize a kind of torsion shear effect in the physical medium. A sudden pulsed de-excitation of an isomer in compound with a substance in a plasma state, and itself in rotation, would be an ideal way to accomplish this. For more detailed information, I highly recommend purchasing any of Farrell's books, especially Philosopher's Stone and Brotherhood of the Bell. They are a great bargain for the amount of information you get. Okay, I don't have time to talk about every speaker at the conference, so I'm only going to mention the ones which pertain directly to my research on anti-gravity and the unified field theory of physics. For more information, including DVD videos and a list of speakers at the event, visit teslatech.info. Links are provided in the description. I will say that Maury King's lecture and his book, which I am now reading, have opened my mind to new possibilities for tapping the zero-point energy. But as far as magnetic motors and perpetual motion machines go, I've seen a lot of people try, but I've yet to see a working model which can perform while under a load. My only advice is to be extremely wary of free energy claims that you see on the internet. Not to say that free energy doesn't exist, but as you can imagine, the disinformation is laid on extra thick by those seeking to keep this technology suppressed. The next two people I'm going to talk about were not originally scheduled to speak at the conference. They just happened to show up. To say the least, I was pleasantly surprised to meet and talk with both Marco Rodin and Sim Harriman. On Saturday night of the conference, I stayed up until 5 a.m. speaking with Marco Rodin and a group of others in the hotel lobby. Marco told us this would be the last time he would ever attend or speak at a conference, so he was trying to get out as much information in a short time as possible. Unfortunately, he can't relay a lifetime of work in only a few hours, so we barely touched the technical aspects of Marco's mathematical research, which was my primary interest. However, we did discuss some of the technical aspects behind the rodent coil and a lot of the history behind it. We also talked a bit about the military and NASA and how they tried to keep their interest in the rodent coil a secret. Their interest in the rodent coil stems from military research into focusing coils, which are used to generate extremely powerful magnetic fields through focusing magnetic field lines into a single point. The most basic focusing coils were made by winding copper wire onto a cone. Later improvements were made by using tapered wire, which ranged from a low gauge or thicker wire 
wide base of the cone to a high gauge or thinner wire towards the tip of the cone. So the inductance would increase proportional to the concentration of magnetic field lines. The Ronin coil focuses magnetic fields through vortex geometry, whereby spiraling magnetic field converge and additively produce a single magnetic field of great strength. For more detailed information, I suggest you read the paper by Russell Blake, the former senior researcher for Microsoft who helped Marco Rodin to physically construct the Rodin coil from his theory. The paper is titled uh, Towards a Mathematical Foundation of the Rodin Coil Torus by Russell P. Blake. Links will be posted in the description. I am now in contact with Marco Rodin through his associates and will hopefully be working with them to bring you more information and detailed explanations of his research. We do not want to see his discoveries go into retirement along with him. Last but not least, I want to talk about Nassim Harriman's recent paper on the Schwarzschild proton, which was not only accepted but chosen by a panel of 11 peer reviewers at the University of Liege in Belgium to win the prestigious Best Paper Award in the field of physics, quantum mechanics, relativity, field theory, and gravitation. This significant paper marks a new paradigm in the world of quantum theory as it describes the nuclei of an atom as a mini black hole where protons are attracted to each other by gravitation rather than some mysterious undefined strong force. This radical new view of the quantum world produces a unification of the forces and appropriately predicts measured values for the nucleons of atoms. It begins with the quantum vacuum density, which is a measured 5.16 times 10 to the 93rd grams per cubic centimeter. Then we calculate how much vacuum energy would exist inside of a proton, which has a radius of 1.32 femtometers, multiplied by 4 thirds pi r cubed to get the volume. A density is mass per unit volume, so if you multiply a density by a volume, the Vs cancel to give the amount of mass that would be contained within a proton volume, which is 4.98 times 10 to the 55th grams, which also happens to be the mass of the entire universe existing inside each and every proton. The sim also believes that this is evidence of an ultimate entanglement of all protons, which he mentions briefly in his paper. Just think of every single proton inside every single atom in your body connected through the vacuum to every other proton in the universe. We then calculate what proportion of the total vacuum energy density available in a proton volume is necessary for the nucleon to obey the Schwarzschild condition for a black hole where the radius of our black hole is now 1.32 femtometers, the radius of a proton, and we solve for m. The mass needed to obey the Schwarzschild condition for a proton radius of 1.32 femtometers is 8.85 times 10 to the 14th grams. Harriman then uses this mass to calculate the gravitational force between two contiguous Schwarzschild protons using the semi-classical approach we yield a gravitational force of 7.49 times 10 to the 47th dynes. If we then calculate the relativistic velocity of two Schwarzschild protons orbiting each other with their centers separated by one proton diameter, we get 2.99 times 10 to the 10th, which is also equal to the speed of light. This essentially means that the protons inside of a nucleus can be thought of as black holes orbiting each other at the speed of light. A fascinating concept. If we then calculate the period of rotation of this system, we get 5.55 times 10 to the negative 23 seconds, which also happens to be the characteristic interaction time of the strong nuclear force. So apparently the strong force is actually quantum gravity at work due to the black hole nature of the Schwarzschild proton. Now it turns out if we plot every object in the known universe onto a logarithmic scale of mass versus radius, we find an approximate linear progression. Oddly enough, the Schwarzschild proton sits almost exactly on this line, while the standard model proton sits far outside, suggesting that the standard model is incorrect after all. I also liked how Nassim showed how one can obtain similar results by using the proton volume to Planck volume ratio multiplied by the Planck mass to get the same result of 4.98 times 10 to the 55th grams, the entire mass of the universe inside every single atom. This is important because the Planck length relates directly to the Fibonacci number and phi golden ratio which is a key mathematical element in all self-replicating systems. The question is, what is replicating itself, and why? 
The answers to these questions and more are coming. Please stay tuned to the Alien Science Channel as we continue to explore the ultimate in science and technology. Thanks for watching. You know what to do.